take out a blank piece of paper. Draw a line down the center. On the left-hand side, I want you to write, happy me. Now close your eyes and think about a time that you remember being happy or more confident or alive. It could be any word you want, right? And you might have to go back to childhood. Our daughter closed her eyes and she said it was senior year in high school. And I said, okay. So write down all of the things that you were doing in a week of your life, senior year in high school. Just describe your life for me. I got up at 7 a.m. or 6.30. I was leaving the house by 7. I was with my friends all day. I was looking forward to going to college. I was playing varsity lacrosse. I was exercising six days a week. I was only partying with friends twice a week. I was in a healthy dating relationship. I ate four dinners a night at home. Great, write down what your life looks like now. I sleep till one. I drink every day. I feel like I don't see my friends because everybody's scattered now that we graduate. I don't have anything to look forward to. My, my trip to Cambodia is canceled. I'm not exercising. Okay, compare the two. Your own life experience offers the map. And we want to overcomplicate these big words like happiness. I know I did for decades or confidence. It's actually found in the little things. If you do this simple exercise of drawing a line down a piece of paper, and you write down what life looked like in great detail. When did you wake up? When did you go to bed? How often were you with friends, family? What were you doing for work, exercise? What were you eating? If you then compare that to what life looks like now, you now know what to do. And the fact is your whole life is the little things. It's when you wake up, it's the first thing you look at, it's what you do with your body, it's how you greet your spouse, it's how you talk to yourself, it's what you say to yourself when you look in the mirror, it's the mood that you walk in to work with intentionally. It's how you greet your animals or your roommate when you end the day. It's the tone of voice that you use. That's your whole life. And if you were to just take the time and intentionally write down a few simple things that you do when you're happy in life, and you were to focus for the next seven days on just adding one of those in a day, you would be very surprised how getting some of the little things right actually starts to turn your life in a completely different direction. I believe that dreams are not meant to be achieved. I believe that your dreams are a directional signal, that the dream is out there in a different chapter of your life, calling you from this moment toward that direction. What I believe about dreams is that the dreams are deeply personal. They are connected to that flame inside you. You were hardwired with them when you were born. It is absolutely part of why you're curious about things, why you're interested in things. Naturally, this is part of your natural intelligence. The reason why I wanted to launch the Mel Robbins podcast is not so that it could become the number one podcast in the world. Of course I have those goals. Of course I wanna be the number one female podcast host in the world. Of course that's what I want. But the reason why I am pursuing this is because I wanted to connect with people at a deeper level. I knew that I would come creatively alive. I knew that I wanted to build an ongoing conversation that was deeper. And I also knew I wanted to learn more because when you're constantly putting out content or you're standing on stages or you're writing books, it's kind of a one-way conversation. And so part of my solve for loneliness was to stop griping about it to myself. What would actually make me feel more connected, what would be of more service to people, what would create a deeper impact. That's why I'm doing this thing. Why is it that I am always gripping onto the thing that makes me unhappy? What is it about this campaign, I call it the campaign of misery. Like instead of focusing on the fact that here I am, first of all, lucky enough to be in Los Angeles to be able to have the means to go see her for Parents Weekend, that I have a relationship with her where she would want to come and just snuggle up and spend the night, that she is pursuing her passion and dream of being a singer-songwriter, that she is just killing it, she's happy. Why am I always defaulting to the loss? And so when I say that I'm working on happiness, what I've realized about myself is that I have done a lot of things in life, but I've spent the vast majority of my life being so busy and keeping myself so busy as a means to outrun, I think, a deep-seated unhappiness. When the pandemic hit and I had to slow down and I had to truly say to myself, okay, you can't go anywhere. 
You cannot regulate your anxiety by running to Target. You can't catch a plane. It's you, you and yourself, and all the coping mechanisms that you used to have that distracted you from the fact that you're just not that happy. They're not there anymore. And unless I want to drink myself into the ground, which I don't, and numb it, or hit the vape pen or take a gut, like, unless I want to numb it, I got to deal with it. And so I've spent the last two years and I continue to focus right now on the number one goal that I have, which is to learn how to be happy and content wherever I am. And so this morning is the perfect example of catching this profound sadness, which is part of the human experience, deeply missing somebody is also about loving them and noticing that I was going into the negative. And part of being content and being happy wherever I am is not trying to fix things. It's being okay with things. It's allowing the emotion to rise up and then noticing that there's a different way to feel. And so in that moment, I just am doing what I'm doing a lot of, which is just breathing through those deep moments where I'm like, why am I complaining about this? It's so stupid. Why am I obsessing about this thing tomorrow? And I'm not even here right now. And reframing things in a more positive way. And this might surprise people because I, I am a very positive person. I am a very optimistic person. But when I really slow down, my mind runs a million miles an hour and normally it's 15 steps ahead, which means I'm never content where I am. And so I've been doing a ton of work like in my nervous system, in my body, instead of going right up here and trying to wrestle with my thoughts, I've been going down into here to just anchor in my body and slow things down and be physically where I am, where my feet are. And so then there was a second thing that happened. So again, I'm working on happiness. That's the thing I'm really like working on. It's like a muscle, right? I'm in the bathroom and I am terrible at doing my hair. I look like a freaking labradoodle on a humid day. Like that's just me. I just have never figured out the hair situation. And so I finally said, that's it. I have got to figure out how to make my hair look halfway. Like I'm not even looking for amazing. I'm just looking for okay. And so I was watching YouTube. I'm learning the tutorials. I've got the right sprays. And so Kendall comes rolling in after she wakes up and I am sitting there trying to curl my hair. And all of a sudden, I hit my freaking ear and I'm like, oh my God, I've, I've just burned my ear. And Kendall casually goes, well, you gotta learn somehow. <laughs> and she walks out of the room. I think there is so much wisdom in that because that is how you learn. That is how you learn how close to hold a curling iron to your ear. You burn yourself. And then your whole body absorbs the lesson and you don't go that close to the fire next time. And I'm doing that dance with happiness and contentment that when I feel the fire of discontent or friction or complaining or looking for what's wrong, I pull the curling iron a little away from the ear and I go back into a safer, calmer place. 